had a deep session on uh, healing and transcending level confusion and experiencing joy, total joy, total happiness. So this is our session this morning. We're going to go into this very deeply. And some of you I see have been on some of the other online uh, retreats we've had. I was going through all the questions, the written questions, and I can tell the ones that have really been following along of what I've been sharing on these online retreats because your questions are starting to revolve around the practical application of what I've shared, which is the most glorious thing, to put it into practice. I mean, even if we use the example of A Course in Miracles, uh, you know, the book being scribed, you know, from 1965 to 1972, then after some editing and publishing, being published in 1976, and now we have uh, five versions of A Course in Miracles. Uh, that can get a little confusing for some. I uh, don't know that Jesus nece necessarily needs to say it five different ways. Uh, one way was probably enough. Uh, but the one thing we can say that's substantially unchanged in all five editions is the workbook. And then he's saying you have to practice the workbook. So he's really calling us into practical application. And I loved hearing all of your responses last night because of one of the th golden threads, the common themes was, I want the experience, I want the direct experience. Uh, some of you even used some very colorful language about uh, book learning and uh, studying the book. Uh, and well, I took that in a very positive way because I see that you were calling out, I want the experience. I don't want the experience of pain. I don't want my mind fixated on, on different symptoms and which ones are coming and which ones are going and what have I got to do to handle these symptoms. And, you know, I, I want to go a lot deeper. I want to go to the core. I want to actually es escape from the dualities of the world and I want to escape from the self-criticisms and judgments that seem to be filling my mind and I want to come back to purity. As the Bible said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So, so it's really beautiful, and I would say, uh, I will use some examples, and I'll give you just a little touch of, of metaphysics at the beginning, uh, because these metaphysics, even though they are not grasped and they're not comprehended, people don't really write many books about these metaphysics because they're so far beyond anything of time and space that, uh, that oftentimes earthlings, humans, uh, you know, it just goes over their, their head, so to speak. They don't, they don't relate to these things. But, but the basic thing is that mind cannot create beyond itself. So we have this situation where we learn in the Course, mind reaches to itself. It does not go out. Within itself is everything, you within it and it within you. Uh, another way of saying it is spirit creates spirit, or love extends love. Uh, this is all at, purely at a realm of spirit. We're always, we're just talking about the kingdom of heaven, and again, this is a state of mind that is entirely beyond the opposites of this world. It's, it's talked about, it's sometimes pointed to, but there is no experience because this world of time and space is a veil drawn, drawn over the truth to hide you from knowing who you are, who God is, what spirit is. And, and basically, along with mind reaches to itself, mind can only extend itself, is this idea that only the thoughts of God can be shared. So God extended God in purely a creation of, of spirit and Christ, which is not a man or a woman. Jesus was a, a symbol or a representation of the Christ, but, but symbols are, are not actualities. The Christ is a, is a pure idea in the mind of God. You might say that God had a thought of Christ, and then Christ has thoughts as well, but these are not 
babies. These are not plants or flowers. These are not insects. These are not butterflies. Uh, these are not forms. Christ has extensions that are purely spiritual. And so when you're talking about awakening from sickness, clearing up level confusion and awakening to the kingdom of heaven within, we're talking about remembering the purely spiritual realm, pure abstract light. It, even angels, you know, are just symbols that point the way back to that light and that love. So only the thoughts of God can be shared. If only the thoughts of God can be shared, then you should be able to deduce that this world can't be shared. It's just a, it's like a personal hell. Everybody, all seven billion seem to have their own version of hell. Uh, but really there's only projection, the attempt to get rid of something you don't want. To, to believe in the ego is to believe in a death wish, is to believe in hell. To project that ego and make up a world of time and space is, is like making your own perceptual nightmare with some goodies and some bad things, some pleasures, some pains, some happy memories and some sad memories. But it's a mix. It's not reality. Uh, reality doesn't have a mix between the good and the bad. It, in the Bible it says, what God created, you know, he called good. And we're saying that's purely spiritual. So, what we call time and space is not a creation of God. I know for a lot of us, whatever culture and religion we come from, you know, if you've come from the Judeo-Christian theology and belief system, you know, in, in Genesis it said God created the heavens and the earth. All right, Genesis got half of it right. Uh, let's give him some credit. Uh, God created heaven. God is heaven. God is love, perfect love, and Christ is perfect love, and the creations of God and Christ are perfect love. But the earth, the time-space cosmos, is an attempt at the impossible. That's why this world, Jesus says, is an impossible situation. Why? Because only the thoughts of God can be extended and the thoughts of this world aren't thoughts of God, so they cannot be extended. So it's just one mind, we'll say, that seems to be sleeping, dreaming the cosmos. And part of that dream is it's dreamed up a world and projected a world of bodies in which there seems to be private minds associated with each body that have private thoughts, that can keep secrets, that can have goals and ambitions for the future and past histories. And all of that is part of a giant fiction, a giant fabrication that has no reality whatsoever. Some of you remember the, the introduction to A Course in Miracles. Nothing real can be threatened. Okay, there's heaven. Nothing unreal exists. That covers the rest. <laughs> that means Earth and the cosmos of time and space don't even exist. Herein lies the peace of God. Nothing real can be threatened because oneness is all there is. Love is all there is. There is only love. And so the beginnings of level confusion is to, to dream the impossible dream. <laughs> you remember that song? To dream the impossible dream. The impossible dream is trying to share something that can't be shared. And that's why when you try to share a concept that God didn't create, it's just a miscreation in the mind and you're trying to share it. We call that projection and in the world of form. And so you're trying to share what can't be shared. It would be like if you were in a concrete prison and you got this strange idea in your mind that you were going to break out by beating your skull against the concrete. That's not a very smart idea. But if you persisted at it, you would have a very bloody <laughs> skull and probably a very smashed up brain if you, if you persisted at trying to blast your way out of a concrete cell by using your skull, the, uh, the human skull. So when you attempt to share something that can't be shared, it gets very frustrating and that's why we have such a high suicide rate, there's so much depression, and even what we call illness is 
simply the attempt to share what cannot be shared. And really, you're not imprisoning anybody else. Remember, it's just a mind that's trying to do something that's impossible, trying to make something up in form, make up an identity, which is what the authority problem is about. Trying to make an identity other than Christ is very frustrating. You know, Popeye would tell you that. I am what I am and that's all that I am. You could go back to Popeye and that would be the end of level confusion. If you could just experience that I am what I am and that's all that I am. And that's why we have to look at this level confusion thing very, very closely. Because the ego is ingenious and the ego is very tricky and the ego needs the mind, the sleeping mind, to continue to experience guilt for the projection to continue. The hallucination will disappear when it's seen for what it is and it's seen as being impossible, then there's no need for the impossible once you see something as impossible. And so we could say that when you're attempting to share something that can't be shared, this is what the authority problem is, and this is where we get into time and space and bodies. Now a lot of our discussion yesterday, last night, was we talked about body symptoms, we talked about uh, care for bodies, responsibility for bodies, not just the body that you've dreamed up that you call your own, but for other bodies, baby bodies, children bodies, animal bodies, kitty cats, dogs, your pets, uh, even mosquitoes, mosquito bodies, any, all the bodies, if you were with my other online retreats, we started talking about, you know, there's going to be a lot of heavy guilt induced for believing you have direct responsibility for those bodies. And that's a common core belief is that you have responsibility for taking care of your body. And if you have children, you have responsibility for them. If you're a manager in a business, you may have responsibilities in belief for your workers, responsibility for co-workers. Politicians oftentimes feel responsibilities for their voters, their constituents. Um, it just goes on and on and on. And this is a web of deception that Albert Einstein called an optical delusion of consciousness. There's a scientific uh, proclamation for time and space. He, he called this cosmos an optical delusion of consciousness. And it is delusional as long as you believe in it. So let me come back to the core of level confusion. First of all, in heaven there are no beliefs. God doesn't know what belief is. Christ doesn't know what belief is. Belief is, it begins with the idea of ego and that's why consciousness, which is the realm of beliefs, is the domain of the ego. There was no consciousness even, there was no split in heaven. There never was such a split, but, but consciousness not only has split, but it has levels. You've heard of levels of consciousness raising your consciousness. This is all within the egoic realm. And to believe that you have responsibility for this error called ego, this error called consciousness, and for all the projections, all the symbols and images, including bodies, if you believe you're responsible for any of that, then you have just taken responsibility in your mind for the impossible. You've taken responsibility for something that could never be so, could never happen. And this induces a false sense of guilt. Being responsible for something that could never even exist. You might say you're taking responsibility for a hallucination. And even if you were in psychiatry or psychology they would say, no you need to learn to release your hallucinations. <laughs> not take responsibility for them. You're, you're doubly insane if you're taking responsibility for your hallucinations. And yet, if we look closely, we all realize we have a lot of responsibility for the body and for other bodies. Maybe family bodies, you know, whatever those bodies are 
in your constellation, in your mind, that you're taking responsibility for, you're placing a false sense of responsibility where it, it can never be placed. And you're also saying, I can create myself, and you're also saying, no, it's more than spiritual creation, there actually is something called physical that is apart from mind. And that is really delusional, to think that there can be something called the physical apart from mind. That violates the, the prime directive, the, pr the only prime the only prime law that there is, is love extends itself and love creates like itself and then to believe in the physical is a total denial of the law of love that God created. So this is the beginning of level confusion, is starting to take responsibility for something that you have no responsibility for. Now a lot of times people will say to me, that all sounds good sentimentally. Uh, sentimentally, I'm with you on that. I can, I can hang with that. But, the big but is, but what about, what about this symptom I have? What about uh, the way that this person treated me or mistreated me? What about uh, handling all the needs and all of the things in this world that seem to be the practicalities on Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs? What about all those lower needs that are in there? I mean, self-actualization, okay, that's at the top. That, that lines up with what you're talking about, but what about the rest? And basically what Jesus is saying is, is that as you use this thing called belief to, with the power of your mind, and, and belief and thought combine into a power surge that Jesus says can, can literally move mountains. So, we can't deny that we have a powerful mind, even though that's part of the whole denial of, of the ego, that we are powerful. But when you take belief and thought, and you put them with that powerful mind, it can move mountains. It's spinning uh, the, the planets, it's moving the stars, it's, it's moving the galaxies, it's, it does more than move mountains. It's so powerful that it's moving, it's moving the whole cosmos around because it's that powerful. But what about it? If you, if you believe in separation and you believe in bodies and you have thoughts that are body thoughts, what are you going to do? How do you get out of this conundrum? Jesus says, well you, you, you make up this responsibility by this belief and this thought and now you have to carefully be unwound out of it. In other words, that's the Holy Spirit's function. If you're in quicksand and the more you struggle, the deeper you go in the quicksand, it may be help, more helpful to just stop and pray and say, help. I, I, everything I do here in time and space seems to put me deeper into the maze. It puts me deeper into the guilt. I try to do the right thing, but I find myself sinking into more depression, more symptoms, more struggles, more difficulties. This should be a, a point where you say, I need help. And that is the function of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to guide us with our thoughts. He can't even intercede and take our fear away, but He can work with us to showing us the conditions in which the, the fear and the guilt were set up. And He can show us the way to escape those. Jesus' mind is the same mind as ours. You know, it, he doesn't have a different mind than ours, it's the same mind. It's the same powerful mind, it's the Holy Son of God. And we're all the Holy Son of God, but if we believe something using that powerful mind, we make up a fairy tale, a make-believe, a dream that needs to be healed and corrected by the Atonement. A thing that we started to touch on last night too was that Everyone was talking about healing, and I asked you to go to sleep with, ponder this thought. The mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. Only an egoic sick mind that believes in separation could believe the body could be sick. The body to the Holy Spirit is just a neutral image. It's no different than a, than a stone than a twig from a tree. It's no different than a drop of water. It's, it's nothing special. It has no special meaning. And Jesus 
goes so far in the Course to say that it has, the body has no meaning at all by itself, and it has no meaning apart from its use, like, and it's, its use by the Holy Spirit. So the only thing that gives the body any semblance of meaning, gives it any just glimmering of meaning at all, is the Holy Spirit's use of the body for communication. Because communication, God and Christ are in communion, and communication is total in heaven. And so if, if the Holy Spirit can use the body as solely as a communication device, that will help you raise up in awareness closer and closer to the Kingdom of Heaven, which is our destiny, is to just remember God and remember who we are as Christ. But the ego has thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different uses for the body. The ego uses the body to attack with. That's what the military is about. And let's not just say the military. Every time you frown at somebody, you scowl at somebody, you scream at somebody, you use the body in some way uh, to, with a, a dirty look or whatever, that's using the body for attack. That's not using the body for love. So any time the body is used for any form of attack, even in the most subtle way, that's not using the body in a helpful way. All it is is reinforcing the separation in the mind. And so it go, you go nowhere. It's like you're stuck in the, in the quicksand and you're just shuffling around and you're moving nowhere. You're, you're just staying stuck. The ego uses the body for pride. What's all this stuff about being popular, being famous, being well known, or in some cases people, you know, like uh, Hitler or Saddam Hussein, you know, different ones, Osama bin Laden, they, they, they become infamous. <laughs> they become famous villains. <laughs> but the mind is, there's just one mind, so you can't have a famous mind. Who would it be famous to? If there's only one mind, and you're one with the mind of God, you don't even get likes or thumbs up or hearts uh, or any kind of recognition. You have, there's no status with it. There's no degrees with it. There's, there's no beauty or ugliness with one mind. There's no disease. There's no, there's no symptoms with one mind. It's mind reaching to itself in the glove and extending purely at a spiritual realm. That's what reality is. And so, this world must therefore be unreality. What do we call this in psychology or psychiatry and medicine? When, when you totally have disconnected and you've had a total break from reality. That's psychosis, psychotic. Level confusion is psychotic. That's why we have to see its impossibility. Second thing, what we call a diagnosis in psychiatry or psychology when somebody has a split mind and they're hearing multiple voices. It's schizophrenic. Level confusion is schizophrenic. What do we t call somebody who's perceiving something that, that doesn't even exist? Delusional. We're saying level confusion is delusional. You're having hallucinations. You're dreaming something that's not even there. You're perceiving something that doesn't have any basis in reality. That's delusional, as, as Einstein called it. So, when we start talking about effects and the body and all the different symptoms that the body has and so on and so forth, we are talking about what Shakespeare called much ado about nothing. And, and I really like that uh, last night when we started to hear a bit about the ideas of, of not taking the, the symptoms of the body so serious anymore. Remember who that was? Who was it that, that brought that up? It was not taking the hip, uh, remember the, the hip uh, surgery and everything. 
That was so beautiful because it was an experience of not be taking the symptoms so serious. I mean, for example, if, if you think about the symptoms, a lot of you shared a lot about the symptoms, but suppose you had a nighttime dream and during your nighttime dream you had all these symptoms. Maybe you were blind, maybe you couldn't walk, maybe you were deaf uh, or whatever in the dream. Maybe you were bleeding, maybe you, know, you had things done to you that were very evil and dastardly seemingly, and then you wake up and you go, whew, that was interesting. You dreamed a dream where you had these symptoms. But when you wake up, you would just have kind of a smile on your face, like V has right now. You'd have that big happy smile on your face because you'd think, thank God <laughs> that wasn't real. <laughs> thank God I just dreamed it. So when you start taking these body symptoms very seriously, it's because you forgot that you're dreaming. That's the one error right there. You've, you've simply forgot that you're dreaming it. You're taking it as reality. Again, that's, that's psychotic, that's schizophrenic, that's delusional, that's hallucinations. But when you take those symptoms to be very real and serious, then you've simply forgotten that you're dreaming. The whole Course in Miracles is about be training your mind, letting miracles be done through you, so much so that the doer disappears and in the end, all identification with the body and the person disappear. And suddenly you're aware of dreaming, like a lucid dream. Like you're having a lucid dream, you're aware that you're dreaming the world. And you're going, you are so happy <laughs> when you come to the place of remembering merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. You know, that's why that song is, is such, so remembered, that, that song, because it, merrily, 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 four merrilies, happily, 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 life is but a dream. That's going to be the release point, is first just to remember that you're dreaming. Because then you will have returned causation to the mind. You're not at the mercy of the dream. You have invented the world you see. You have generated this world of time and space. You are not at the mercy of it. You might say it's at the mercy of your mind and once you kind of kiss it goodbye, it's gone forever. Because it doesn't have any reality. God didn't create it, so it doesn't have any reality, any stability. Now, it seems to human beings, these symptoms that seem to be identified as the sickness, again, the Holy Spirit sees the body as neutral, so to the Holy Spirit and to the angels, it's, it's kind of, it's laughable. They chuckle when they, they think that there's a belief that symptoms are what sickness is, because they know that the sickness is the ego, believing in the ego. It has nothing to do with what's going on with the body. And in fact, I would say sometimes that now you may curse God and say, how dare you give me these uh, symptoms, but God doesn't give symptoms. God, God creates Christ, that's what God does. It's an extension of love, but if you have symptoms, or let's even be a little more subtle, let's say you're having pain and discomfort, and when you're having pain, it can be so intense at times that you have an urgency to find the cure. You have an urgency for the miracle. You have an urgency for atonement when you're in pain. And, and I heard some expressions of that last night. Also, I want to thank the, everyone that wrote in the question. One of the, the most clear and direct expressions of of uh, pain came from our friend Carly out in California. And when I read this to you, you'll see what I mean by the urgency, the impetus to find the miracle. There's a, a deep call to find the healing, especially when you're experiencing the pain. Because let me give you a contrast. Suppose you think you're a successful, healthy human being and you're just 
gliding down the highway and happy for that new raise that you've got and that new Porsche that you just bought and that great organic lifestyle that you're living. I mean, you are on the top of the world. You've got this. Oh, you've got a few stresses at work occasionally, but yeah, but the perks are worth it. A little bit of stress never hurt anybody. And you think you are successful as the world judges successful. And you don't even have that much pain in your life. Maybe a little stress, a little intensity here and there. But what if I said you're, you're living double oblivion? You're, you're totally unaware of your function as a miracle worker. You're totally successful as the world judges it, but you haven't really a clue about miracles. You're not even sure they even exist. In fact, you're so successful in this world, you've got all the perks that the world offers, you're not even sure God exists. You're just gliding down the highway, you know. A bad day is when you have a flat tire. That's a bad day, you know. You've got it made. Well, I'm saying when you are experiencing pain and discomfort, you have more of an impetus to say, what's it all about? More of an impetus, more of an urgency to say, I've got to heal. There's got to be more to life than these trinkets, uh, trinkets of time and space. So I'm grateful that Carly wrote this in. She said, I have had pain in my vaginal and urinary areas for over 15 years, and sometimes it flares up so much that I can't stand it. Right now I'm in the middle of one of those flare-ups, and it has been the longest lasting one ever. I want to die instead of continuing to feel this pain. I can't understand what it is about and what I need to do to, to get it to go out of my awareness. I've talked to my husband about my many private thoughts lately, exposing everything that I thought could have to do with this, and the physical sensations didn't change at all. It feels like a punishment from God, even though that isn't true. I feel so down that I have no idea how I will be lifted from this experience. My question is, what can I do, if anything, to help myself? When you experience intense pain, or in a, in a lengthy way, your mind has a huge impetus, because there's somewhere deep down inside that you know that you are a, a child of light, that you know that joy is your inheritance, that happiness is your inheritance. You know that you are entitled to miracles, and you know that God's will for you is perfect happiness, and this experience of this kind of intense pain, almost a, where you feel like, I can't go on, I want to die, when you start to have those thoughts, there is a strong impetus for healing. You're not twice removed from from God. You're not in double oblivion anymore. You're actually crying out, I, I need an answer, I need an experience, I need a release. And, and that's what this is about. That's what we're talking about today. I'm going to go into great detail about that release. The good thing is you're ready for a release. You're, you're, you're very ready for a release. And your willingness is growing stronger and stronger because you, it's like you say, I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand it. Whether it's emotional pain, whether it's depression, suicidal thoughts, whether it seems to be physical pain, there's a part of you that cries out and says, this is not, this can't be real. This cannot be true. If this is a, a dream, this is a nightmare. And I, I have to find escape from this pain. So. What that is doing is it's bringing up a call for love. That, that is a call for love. That is a call for, for help. Now it seems like every person, every body is different in this world. And it seems like everybody has a mind of their own. But I would like to bring in some examples as we start to go to this release from the pain. Is everybody familiar with a diagnosis in psychiatry called multiple personality disorder? Is everyone familiar with multiple personality disorder? Some of you might have even seen the, the movie Sybil. It's quite famous. Or in recent years, uh, we had a movie called Split. Some of you might have even seen Split. Down here in Mexico, it's Fragmentado. 
But it's, <laughs> I'll speak in English, I know. What the language I know, it's called Split. That's the title of the movie, and it's this movie of split personality. And the thing about split personalities is, is these personalities are so distinct. The, the voice seems to change. The facial, the way the face is, is carried changed. They dress differently. Um, one might have diabetes. Another of the personalities doesn't have diabetes. One might have cancer. The other one might not at all. These cases of, of multiple personalities, if you like to do research, that should be the first evidence of how powerful the mind is. One of the personalities has di diabetes and needs to take insulin and needs injections, the other doesn't. One has active cancer cells, the other doesn't. It's showing you, these movies are showing you the power of the mind, that the mind generates everything about the body, all the symptoms are generated from the mind, and even a shift in mind to another personality self, and, and it just, they just disappear instantaneously. As soon as they shift over into another personality, the diabetes is gone in an instant. The cancer is gone in an instant, when the mind is just shifted to another personality. Now let's stretch that a little bit further. What if we're all one sleeping mind of Christ, and what if the seven billion bodies, the seven billion different personalities on this planet is just one giant case of multiple personality disorder? Try that one on. <laughs> Try that one on. You're concerned about the symptoms of your body, but your friend doesn't have those symptoms. You say to your friend, well, I'm glad that you're healthy, but I'm sick. I'm sick and you're healthy. Wait a minute. This is all a projection. It's the ego that tells some bodies that they're healthy and tells some bodies that they're sick. That's just the judgment. It's just, if, if there's seven billion personalities that are involved in this multiple personality disorder, the disorders in the mind, just like in these movies, Sybil and Split, the disorders in the mind. What does that do to your view of symptoms? And would you like it if some of your brothers and sisters could be sick or dying and others could be healthy and living? That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem very fair to have some sick ones and some well ones. And then the well ones get paid a lot of money. They're called doctors. <laughs> doctors and nurses and practitioners, you know, they get paid a lot of money because they help people remove symptoms. But what if it's all psychological? What if all illness is mental illness? That's what Jesus is teaching us in the Course. All illness is mental illness. The only psychosis is in the mind. The schizophrenia is in the mind, but not in separate private minds. People don't have schizophrenia. People don't have psychosis. The sleeping mind is psychotic. The sleeping mind is schizophrenic. The sleeping mind is hallucinating a world of unreality. There's one problem and one solution, and all you have to do is realize for an instant that you made it all up. I mean all of it. All of history. You have to realize that you made all of history up. And then you're going to be ready for, for the correction, for the happy dream that shows you a different perspective of the whole thing. Not a linear timeline, but it will show you a, a simultaneous view of everything. You know, they talk about parallel lifetimes. All, everything's parallel. Everything's going on simultaneously. And only the ego strings it out over past, present, future in a timeline. So when you start to feel pain, it's reaching your awareness, it's being raised up into awareness just for one reason, and not to punish you, because God doesn't even know of punishment, but just to show you that there is a need for a shift. You're, you're in need of a shift when you have, have that pain. Now, the other thing about pain, Jason mentioned that last night, was the pain and pleasure. The prayer, wasn't the prayer at the beginning, show me that 
pain and pleasure are, are the same. That's, that's a concept that the ego does not want you to raise into awareness. Um, the ego wants you to believe that pain and pleasure are different, so that you can pursue one and try to avoid the other, not seeing that they're actually the same. That when you pursue one, you get the other. When you try to avoid one, you're really trying to avoid both, but actually there has to be a solution beyond that. We have teachings in the Course from Jesus that say, it is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. That's a very interesting line. And there's one point in the text where Jesus says that the reason that pain and pleasure are the same is because they serve the same purpose. Whenever Jesus starts to talk about purpose, we take note. Pain and pleasure serve the same purpose of reinforcing the body as reality. When you have either one, there's a reinforcement. Because why? Because the body is at the realm of duality and multiplicity. And pain and pleasure both serve the purpose of reinforcing that and keeping the level confusion going. Whereas the miracle, when you're above the battleground, when you're being used by Christ and the Holy Spirit to expand your perception, to include everything in your perception, the miracle lifts you out of that pain-pleasure conundrum. And that's why we have a line in the Course, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. I think it was Kat Katerina in Austria wrote in, and basically that was that was one of the shortest questions in here, but it was so beautiful. Katharina writes in, Father, what is your will for me? What is it that I should hear or see or say that I may only do your will and recognize that it is mine as well? That's the question that Katharina wrote in from Austria. That's getting down to the prayer of the heart. That's really simplifying this whole thing about level confusion because if God's will is for perfect happiness and, and God and Christ share the same will and who we are is Christ, when we ask for the Father's will, guess what we're asking for? We're asking for our own will. We're asking to know our true will. Now that's a prayer. That's, that's a question mark at the end, but it's, it's actually a prayer. You could put an Amen at the end of that. Now, a lot of the questions here get into responsibility, like responsibility for a child that, that has difficulty sleeping at night. Um, also, uh, Laura, Laura Bryant wrote in about the feeling of loss that she's experiencing with her, with her cat dying. And even having thoughts like, wow, if I had just healed my mind, would my cat still be alive if, if I had healed my mind? Uh, but whenever we think about healing, we have to realize that healing is synonymous with atonement. And atonement is described in the Course as the first miracle and the last miracle and all the miracles in between. Atonement is the correction. Atonement is the escape hatch. Atonement is salvation. So, there's also a workbook lesson that says, only salvation can be said to heal. That in this world, cure is kind of got a bad reputation. Oh, so-and-so's cured. Well, that was two weeks ago. Now they've had a relapse. Or, oh, I just had an operation, I'm cured of, of this heart problem I had, and the blood circulation, and then years later, oh, it's come in another form. Symptoms come in all kind of shapes and sizes and forms because as long as you have the belief in the ego, as long as you have the belief in the death wish, sickness comes from the death wish. And until you forgive or release the ego, you really haven't cured anything. All you've done is move around the deck chairs on the Titanic, you know. The ship is going down. You can rearrange the deck chairs any way you want, but it's going down. And the world is a construct of the ego. So 
it's not like the world is going to resurrect. Your mind will resurrect when you realize the ego isn't real. But don't expect the world of time and space to resurrect. Don't expect that when you heal your mind, oh, the perfect politicians will be elected and your neighbors will be singing and dancing like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and your cat will just curl up and purr on your lap and never ask to go outside and never poop or pee. Your cat will just be there mm, purring all the time, a few meows and only purrs, not a, not a whine, not a, not a scream. Oh, there we go. The, the cats are coming in. We have the cats here with us today. There we go. Thank you, V. <laughs> I can see it. There's another one. There, there they are. But they're all coming out now. You know, you, you will, when you resurrect, to resurrect is to see the world with the Holy Spirit. And remember, the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, the body is just a neutral symbol. It's not positive or negative. I was, this morning I, uh, I was listening to, to a, the Course and I was actually uh, struck by what I was listening to it was so perfect for our topic today. Isn't that amazing, the synchronicities when you're listening to the Course? And what I found here was, it was from chapter 8, the the body as a means of communication. And the whole section is basically saying that the, the body is only used by the Holy Spirit for communication, for nothing else, only for communication. And in that sense, it, it awakens you to your reality as you are a divine mind. You, you never were a body, you never were in a body, you were just hallucinating a dream in which you seemed to be a body, but that had no reality. And so he's saying when you equate yourself with the body you will always experience depression. Isn't that amazing? When you equate yourself with your body you will always experience depression. It's only a trick when you're happy for a while at, oh I got the ice cream cone, oh I married the perfect person, oh I just got the, the best job in the world, I, I, I'm going to keep this job the rest of my life, oh whatever, <laughs> fill in the blank, whatever the outcomes are, that's not pseudo-happiness. What is he telling us here? When you equate yourself with the body, you will always experience depression. That just means that there are no happy bodies. You can let go of happy bodies too. You can let go of sick bodies and let go of happy bodies, joyful bodies. When you equate yourself with the body, you will always experience depression. Then it gets better. It just goes on and on and on. The ego separates through the body, the Holy Spirit reaches through it to others. You do not perceive your brothers as the Holy Spirit does, because you do not regard bodies solely as a means of joining minds and uniting them with yours and mine. The interpretation of the body will change your mind entirely about its value. Of itself it has none. That's what I was just saying. Of itself a body has no value. If it's used by the Holy Spirit, to light your mind up, to expand your perception, oh my gosh, then you'll see these feelings of joy growing stronger and stronger. But, but what about that? But the ego has come up with all kinds of other things for the body. In fact, here's what Jesus says, the body is beautiful or ugly, peaceful or savage, helpful or harmful according to the use to which it is put according to the use. So if you're just using the body solely as a communication device, solely, as a means of joining, connecting with your brothers and sisters, wow, what a great experience that's going to be. I can tell you I've been doing that for 27 years and I'm having a blast. And I'm wondering why everybody just doesn't join me immediately. Drop everything. Drop everything and get into this joy. It's a joy party because it's being used for its only purpose, the only thing that's helpful. Use it for truth and you will see it truly. Misuse it and you will misunderstand it because you have already done so by misusing it. Interpret anything apart from the Holy Spirit and you will mistrust it. 
This will lead you to hatred and attack and loss of peace. So it does go on to say basically that, that health is inner peace, that illness is some form of external searching. What does he mean by that? Illness, there's a new definition for us. We're talking about illness and level confusion. Illness is some form of, of searching in externals. That's a very interesting definition. You don't hear that very often. Imagine going to the doctor and getting a diagnosis. Oh, you're, you're searching for externals. Is it, is it my heart? No, no. It's, you're searching for externals. But I'm having trouble breathing. Yeah, you're searching for externals. But I've got a sore ankle. I'm, I'm hobbled. I, can, I need some crutches. Just sit down and quit searching for externals. Imagine if your doctor told you that. That's what Jesus would, Dr. Jesus would tell you. He would say, if you're searching for externals, you're ill. Didn't he say something about the kingdom of heaven is within? Does anybody remember that part in the Course where he says, Seek not outside yourself, for it will fail, and you will weep each time an idol falls. Yeah, this Dr. Jesus has got a very different prescription for finding inner peace and happiness, and a very different definition of illness. He's saying, if you're searching for externals, if you're searching for that perfect partner, mm-mm bodies, that's externals. If you're searching for that perfect job, the job that's your dream job that will make you happier than anything else, mm -hmm. searching for externals, you'll get sick. If, you're, if your cat or dogs ran away and you're, you're, you've organized a search party uh, in the whole neighborhood, a neighborhood watch to find your precious Buffy or your, your precious Tinker, that, now those Buffy and Tinker are externals. If you're searching for that magic cure that will take your whatever symptom away and you're waiting till the doctors, the scientists come up with a cure for something like that. If you're searching for Mother Earth to be cleansed of the pollution and the chemicals and the chemtrails and, and the landfills and all of the things that are happening now, seemingly in the ego's perception of Mother Earth, you're still searching for externals. If you can't wait for the next election to get a, see a different president elected, you just are counting the days, you're searching for externals. It'll make you ill, looking off into the future for future outcomes, when you need a present cure, you need a present shift of mind, you need a new purpose. So, if the sole function of the body for the Holy Spirit is communication, that means anything else will make you ill. Now let's get a little deeper. How many of you have worked at jobs and you've worked in the economical system of this world? Whatever country you live in. Okay? Any hands going up? Uh, they're, all in, they're all mystics. They're, no, of course you've worked in, for jobs and everything. And does that economic system involve anything about competition? Is there any competition in that economic system? Well, I'll tell you what Jesus has to say from A Course in Miracles about competition. He says, never forget your need to be vigilant against the idea of competition. That's what Jesus has to say. They say, is Jesus a communist? Is he a socialist? Is he a capitalist? Well, I'll tell you one thing. He tells us we have to be vigilant against the idea of competition. What does that mean for you? I know a lot of you have said, well, if I completely am non-judgmental, if I'm just totally loving, accepting of every circumstance, every outcome, every situation, every person, I'm going to lose my job. You're damn right you're going to lose your job because the ego made up competition and the ego made up the entire system of, of supply and demand, economics. That's right. The dream world that you've seen generated by the ego is, is diseased. It is flawed because of the maker of this 
time-space world of lack and need, supply, demand, supply-side economics. I know. I was in university for 10 years. I studied all these things. I learned a bunch of nothing. But now I'm here to tell you. I bought a ticket to the world, but now I've come back again. That's right, I'm back. I'm back now. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you truly follow this course, you know, this course will be believed entirely or not at all, you will end up leaving it all behind. I'm tired of, of authors and teachers of spirituality just telling you just live a normal life, grow old, get sick and die, and then God will be there for you. I'm telling you, you're here as a miracle worker. You're here to live a transcendent life. You're here to transcend the laws of, of economics, of time and space. You're here to transcend the laws of friendship, transcend the laws of medicine. A lot of nutrition things came in here too. Organic, you know, eat the right thing. No, 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 that's level confusion. That's level confusion. You can be guided as you believe you're unwinding from this, you can still be guided on what foods to eat, what things to drink, or to fast. Maybe you become a breatharian. You just use, live off the air for a while, seemingly, as long as you believe you're a body. It's all right. All that's beautiful. But ultimately, when we come to the end of level confusion, we start to realize that if you realize that there's no causation in the level of form with anything, then all the beliefs of this world are knocked over like bowling, uh, bowling pins on a bowling alley. You get a strike. You just knock all the pins down with that one miraculous ball that's thrown just in the right way by the Spirit. I'm saying that you, this goes very deep, and if you really want to go for the atonement, if you really want to have unbounded joy and happiness, it can only be found in fulfilling your function. That's another course workbook lesson. My happiness and my function are one. That your function is going to bring you out of the level confusion. It's not about anybody telling you don't do this, don't eat this, don't do this, don't do that. It's not about the don'ts. It's more about forgiveness, function, atonement. Do only that. Put your full focus, your full attention on being used by Jesus and the Holy Spirit as a miracle worker, and Jesus will take care of everything else. He will take care of the body. He will take care of all the bodies. He will take care of the planet. He will take care of this solar system and the galaxies. He will take care of everything in time and space if you give yourself over to accepting the atonement. In fact, it's going to be more of a breeze than you ever imagined because when you give up trying to control all those logistics, all those things around the bodies, that's very weary, wearying, that's very time-consuming, that's very heavy. When you give yourself over to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and let all things else be added unto you, everything gets taken care of without exception. Because why? Because you're back up in the miraculous realm of living and, and everything in time and space is just orchestrated to serve the miracle. That's what he says in the Course. He says, I will rearrange time and space for you if you will perform miracles, if you will allow me to perform miracles through you. I will rearrange time and space. None of us grew up with that. Did you ever have any talks with your parents when you were like seven years old about miracles and your parents is like, yes, don't be too concerned about grades and don't be concerned about cutting the grass, you know, doing the dishes and everything. You're a miracle worker and you should pop right into your miracle working functions right now at seven years old. And don't worry about the future because Jesus will arrange all of time and space. He'll handle your entire future. You don't need to go to college. You don't need to get a job. You concerned about attracting a partner? No, Jesus will handle that too. He will handle even your relationships if you give yourself over to this purpose. Sounds like that song. Once you have accepted his plan as the one function 
you would fulfill. There will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you. Without your effort, he will go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar the way. Nothing you need will be denied you, not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought for nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. That's lilies of the field. That's what he was teaching 2,000 years ago. Look at the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor toil. Now, some people think I'm talking crazy. This is my life. This is as natural to me as breathing. A Course in Miracles is not a career for me. I don't have a career. If you go and you Google my name and it comes up with, it says something like author. I am not an author. You don't think Jesus really author, sat down and authored books. They just wrote down, they, they wrote down the words that he spoke. It's the same thing that happens with me. It's just, I, I can't believe it. I see, I look in there and I'm shocked. I see author. I know that I am not the author of myself and I can't really author anything. That God is the author of reality and God authors everything in spirit. So I'm very clear about that, but it's kind of funny to see these things, but it's just a bunch of people who who were inspired by the words, so they wrote, they typed out the words, they transcribed them, they put them into books, they put covers on them, they stick it together and they, it's a book and suddenly I'm an author. But I, I'm just, I'm just talk. That's all I do is talk. And I, people say channeling, I'm not channeling anybody, I'm just, it's just me. This is just me speaking. And but me is everywhere. Like in Lucy, you know, I'm everywhere. There's not a, it's not contained in a person. It's not a personal thing. And you can put all kinds of labels onto it, but it, that, that doesn't really make it what it is. So the key point that I'm sharing is that it's not that, oh my God, what have I got to give up next for this atonement thing? You know, like, okay, God, all right. I've tried being a human, it didn't work out too well, but I guess I'm ready to give up all the things that I like in the world so I can do my function and be happy. You know, you, that's not the way it is. This isn't about a real giving up, this is about ascending and embracing the joyful function that, that the Holy Spirit is offering. The Holy Spirit is ready for, for the function of forgiveness to be activated in the mind. Not this slow kind of time-released ego, time-lapse where everything moves so slow, it's like watching the grass grow, it's activating your function and realizing that that's the only purpose that the body has, is that function. Let's say you're, you say, well wait a minute, I'm a mother, or I'm a father, I have children, I would love to have this wonderful purpose activated, but I've got too many responsibilities. I don't have any time during the day. I'm breastfeeding, I'm feeding, I'm doing all the clothes, I'm taking children to school and driving around and, and I go from like 6 o'clock in the morning till like 7 o'clock at night and I'm too tired at night to do my function because I've got, I'm burned out from all the weight of all these responsibilities. The world that you perceive is upside down and backwards. No. The purpose of everything is for forgiveness. And if you're putting your mind's attention into all these other things that the ego has made up for you to use your body for, of course you're going to be tired. If you follow the ego for like seven hours, eight hours in a row, just going around being a busy doing, uh, doing all these things because I should, I ought to, if you give all that over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Holy Spirit will light that up too. It will, you'll find the holy encounters going to school. You'll see that with your children, every encounter is a holy encounter and you're there to just bless. 
Uh, one of you wrote in about um, responsibility. It was this thing about, what do I do with my daughter if I'm not really responsible for what she eats or if I don't watch out for my daughter, she'll kill herself in one day, I think is what basically you wrote. But Lini from Sweden, if, if you, but if you start to get into this function, which again is your only function, your only purpose for the body, those kind of responsibilities will still get handled, but with the Holy Spirit. In other words, like if there's a time when you're supposed to go over to your daughter and to help something out. I mean this, I had this with my cat, Tripod, one time where I was, uh, I was in the kitchen of the Peace House and my three-legged cat, Tripod, was climbing a tree. You know how cats like to try and climb trees? Go up. She climbed, she raced, she came run, bounding with three legs and she started up this apple tree. And then she got up on a branch and she was teetering like she was going to, he couldn't keep her balance with her three legs, she was going to fall. And a friend of mine was like, oh my God, your cat's going to kill itself uh, falling out of that tree. And I said, ah, it's all in divine timing. I, I walked out, opened the door, got outside. By the time I got under the tree, tripod dropped into my hands. Just perfect. You see, that's the perfect timing. The key was I wasn't in fear about losing my cat. I just let it be orchestrated to go out there and catch tripod as she fell from the branch. And you can do that with everything, absolutely everything. I mean, I, one time I, I was in, I think I was in Oklahoma and this psychologist had invited me to come and visit her and her husband was away and, uh, at work and then so she had a little, uh, she had a little child and she said, David, I'm so stressed I can't take my eyes off of this child of mine because he, he's, he gets into everything. He makes a mess of everything. He destroys everything in the house unless I'm with him 100% of the time. So I said, well, let's, let's sit down at the kitchen table and have a nice talk. So she brought the, the little uh, chair, a little high chair for the boy to sit in and the boy, she put him in the high chair and, he's, and we started to have this deep metaphysical conversation about undoing everything and we're having this wonderful conversation. The little boy, she had put his some coke in a sipper cup with you know, the lid so you can't spill it all over everything. And he's watching us have this conversation. I can look over at the little boy and he's got the biggest smile on his face. He's very mischievous. He takes the coke with the sipper cup and he starts to shake it out onto the table the kitchen table, and he's smiling, and he's shaking this Coke out, and then she's like watching out of one corner, like she's trying to stay with me, but she's watching the, what her son is doing, and then finally the little boy takes his hands up like this and splashes down, and Coke flies everywhere, all over her hair, all in her face, on my face, I'm dripping with Coke. I'm just loving it because I'm seeing the whole situation as holistic. I just love to have coke on my face, uh, especially when a little kid is having such glee spreading it. That's the best time to have coke on your face. I think I even licked a little bit of it there because I was having it. So, and she, she looked at me and she said, now that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm dealing with every day. And I said, what's the problem? What's the problem here? When you're in a holistic Holy Spirit perception, you see everything working together for the good. Nothing's out of place. A little child spraying coke all over. And then we're both sitting there dripping with coke and the little boy has got coke all over him too because he's poured it on the table. Then her husband comes in. He's like, boy, what's going on here? And I said, we're just having a lot of fun. And these are the kind of encounters you have when you have no investment in outcomes. But once you believe in competition, once you believe in scarcity, lack, need, and you get caught up into this big entangled societal ego projection, then you start to feel like, how am I ever going to escape? How am I going to get out of this? Another question that was written in, Willow, oh Willow. I can tell Willow is, has been on this before because her questions are getting 
to the point of how do I transcend this uh, self-concept? I'm sure it's in here. Here we go. Here's what Willow wrote. Can you speak into the idea of letting go of form, self-concepts, etc.? Does the teaching point to a literal, she puts in capitals, to a literal letting go of form? For example, leave the job, relationship, etc. to devote life to God. Or is the teaching suggesting to let go of the attachment to the job, relationship, etc., give over to the Holy Spirit and ask to be done through while still remaining in it? The deeper call of my heart is tr capital trust, exclamation. I am feeling guided to literally let go of the business, the cats, the comfort. Here are some thoughts that go through my mind. Is it Spirit's voice guiding me to walk out of the life I know? What if this is the ego trying to sabotage? Walk away from friends, comfort, familiarity, my cats. How do I do that? Can't I awaken and still be in this life I made up? Now that's getting down to the, to the really the core of what we're talking about here. Can I have my normal life and keep the things that I have come to love and enjoy in this world and be free of level confusion? Well, let's, let's take a look at that. If, if level confusion is starting to see that there's no causation in form, and it's a complete re reversal of the ego, the ego's belief, uh, you will see that everything in the world, the body, the cats, the business, and everything, you start to see everything is just a reflection of mind. But as long as I'm perceiving it through the ego filter of linear time, there's going to be guilt. You know, it's like Tolstoy, you know, he, he was a Russian writer, a pretty famous Russian writer, but he looked around him and he saw all the poor people, all the poverty in Russia, and so he decided that he would give away all his money and all his possessions to the poor people of Russia. And then he was depressed. Instead of being wealthy and frustrated, he was poor and depressed. <laughs> and what happened was he still was trying to do the form to alleviate the guilt. You know, these poor people, I have more than they do. I'll give them what I have, and he was still looking for a solution in terms of form. This is no different than socialism or Marxism, communism, you know, cut the pie in a more equal way than capitalism. It still is no solution, it still doesn't. Now, if, if instead Tolstoy had said, ah, the reason I perceive all these peasants is because of a belief in my mind, and I need to release this belief in more and less, in the haves and the have-nots, and inequality in society, the, the rich have it good, the poor have it bad, the healthy have it great, the sick have it bad, the newborns have a whole life to look forward to, the dying people, you know, they're at the end of life. That's all part of a belief system. And if you start to transcend and get into the joy of your function, I will, I guarantee you, the Holy Spirit and Jesus have a lot to speak through you, lots of smiling to be done through you, lots of hugging, lots of going, bringing good cheer, bringing happiness and joy to whatever situation you come to, wherever it is. But in many respects, we do, we are literally pulled out of the constructs of the repetitive Groundhog Day experiences that we have had. You know, our mornings look similar, we get up, we get out of bed, brush our teeth, bathe, get our hair ready, go do this, go through this, that. We earn our green paper strips and piles of metal disc, or we, we have them automatically transferred into bank accounts and we use our plastic cards all day long. And it's very repetitious, this thing that goes on and on. And we're usually identified in some profession, with some kind of identity that we have to protect, that we have to uh, do marketing with, we have to, you know, put it out so we can keep the money flowing and this and this. That's what the, the normal life, maybe in the United States, in some countries, third world countries, you know, maybe it's carrying water 
just getting water for the family or, or getting enough food to eat, more like hunting and gathering. But whatever that repetitive thing is, as you start to let your mind be lifted up and you start to realize that your mind is causative and you're paying so close attention to your thoughts and to your beliefs, as you start to purify that consciousness and release those false beliefs, then the way the world looks is, for most cases, it's going to seem to change in a dramatic way. Jesus Christ is the best example of that. Maybe he was a fisherman. Maybe he did help Joseph out with different things, or a, a, carp, a carpenter. Uh, maybe he built some houses back there in, in the day. And, but when he reached a point, let's say he got to be about 30 years old and he'd been pondering many things and suddenly this, the Holy Spirit in Jesus got really activated. And suddenly he started having these thoughts that were not really human at all. I and the Father are one. That's a very unhuman thought. <laughs> He wasn't talking about Joseph, he was talking about God. And all of a sudden, he started to realize, before Abraham was, I am. And he started to get in touch with the eternal nature of his being. Well, for the next three years of that public ministry, he, was, he spoke in fishing boats, he walked and talked. He used whatever he could as to just extend that presence of unconditional love with wherever he went. And yes, the dead were raised. Yes, the sick were healed. Yes, those were all just reflections of his mind that death isn't real and sickness isn't real. It was more a state of mind that he was radiating. So the form can look very different. Uh, when I, back in the 1990s when I had students, that was some of the biggest things. It was like, well, if I go on the road with you to do traveling and teaching, I'll, I'll miss my, uh, my, uh, my children, I'll miss my animals, and so on and so forth. To their delight, when we went out to shine the light and to sh share these beautiful ideas, there were other children that showed up. They just weren't their own children. There were other animals that showed up. I mean, if I was traveling with an animal lover, there were animals everywhere. Susanna knows that. We go into the, everywhere we go. We had two or three dogs coming at us. You know, it's all thought. And basically, you have the things that you value, which is extending the love and, and sharing these profound ideas about releasing all guilt and all fear. And then the things that the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they even know the ego preference system. So if you like particular kinds of food, maybe when you're at home and you like to make salmon or particular kind of oriental foods or so on and so forth, when you go on the road where you don't seem to have the control over where you're going to be and who you'll be with and this and that, those kind of things start showing up. But it's not because you earned the money, you spent the money to go by it, they just show up and start coming at you. And that's the Spirit's way of saying, I got gotcha. you. Listen, this is not a path of deprivation. This is not a path of, of lack. You're going to be flooded with more witnesses of love and joy than you've ever seen before. But they won't be coming from an egoic sense of trying to get them. They will just be coming in from following the purpose and these little sweet reminders that I'm so loved and cared for. But the form can, can seem to shift in pretty dramatic ways. It's, the most important thing is the attitude. That's what really needs to shift. But, but the form can uh, take that way. And the ego can try to prevent you from, from cutting loose with the, the purpose by saying, oh, you're throwing away the, most, the loving things in your life that you've loved that are so precious to you, when actually it's who you are is precious. The Christ is precious and everything else is just symbols that the Spirit will use. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I know a lot of people, they study the book for 30 years in groups and they go round and round and round, but the actual living it, the actual following your intuition, 
following the guidance and going for it, which opens up huge doors, takes you higher and higher, they, will, they won't know it in this lifetime because they, they were trying to bring the truth into the illusion. <laughs> they were trying to hold on to their little personality self and hoping that the, the gates of heaven would just open up and shine on their, their little spot in the universe. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So thank you. <laughs> It's a great question. That question needs to be in all of these uh, retreats. How do I let go of the self-concept? That's a question. That's a question because that's getting more to how can I be lifted up to serve in a higher purpose than how do I make my personal life a little bit better? You know, that, that other one is not... Even symptom removal, you know, it's like it, it can be it can come, but it comes from a shift in the mind. It doesn't, it doesn't come from like trying to do something active to remove a specific symptom. It's, it comes in a different way. How are we doing? Oh, great. We've got plenty, plenty of time. Yeah, why don't we, Jeff, why don't we go to the airwaves to see if somebody has a, a question or a comment? From Sounds like a great idea. So if you do have a question or comment, just scroll to the bottom of your screen, click on the participant icon, click on raise hand, and we will be talking to you. Okay, Laura was first off the mark there. Go ahead, Laura. Hi. Thank you very much for everything. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, I don't understand very well, because if I made up all this thing, all the war, all the cosmos, but I am not responsible of it. I, I, this is not very clear for me. Uh, maybe I want to be guilty still. <laughs> maybe. And the second question is how I give myself over the spirit because I really don't know. I I, I don't know how to do that. I I, I don't. It's like I need a step one, a step two, a step three, a step four. That's it. <laughs> so that's that's my my questions. Thank okay. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Laura. Yeah. Well, too, and I'm just reminding that, remembering, being reminded that you're in Mexico, we're in Mexico, so maybe we should get together. Mi casa, su casa, uh, <laughs> because that could be helpful um, to come together in that way. But the first question was not understanding the idea that I, I am not responsible for the cosmos. Well, the cosmos is, is a projection or the Big Bang and all of what seems to be the fragmented time-space cosmos is all part of the, the belief that made it up. So the cosmos was made by the ego. But you're not the ego. You're the Christ. So how can you be responsible for something that you actually didn't do? You, you never could, the Christ can never separate from God. So in other words, there's this puff of nothingness, this belief called ego, which really can have no reality. God didn't create the ego, so it doesn't even have a reality. But if that is the, the belief that generated all of time and space and the whole cosmos, you can't possibly be responsible for it and its world, but you are responsible for accepting the correction for it. In other words, that's because that's the closest reflection of your love as the Christ, is the Holy Spirit and the atonement, which is the correction. So that's why Jesus says the miracle worker and the teacher of God have only one responsibility. Sole responsibility is to accept the atonement. That's it. None of the other things are your responsibility. Now there's a very famous section in the course called the Responsibility for Sight. It's a very famous section. And it says, I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience. And I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. 
If you ever feel like a victim or you ever feel mistreated, just read that passage. <laughs> that's, that's the cure right there, that's the answer. But the first line is, I am responsible for what I see. What he means by that is, I am responsible for how I see the world. You're not responsible for the error, you're not responsible for the separation or the fragmentation, you're just responsible for seeing it with the Holy Spirit, for aligning with God and, and perceiving the world with the Holy Spirit. So that's where your energy needs to go, that's where your energy is, can be channeled. And I really like the way you really were articulate, you really wrote out everything about your life, how your life in this world has been, and that it's been um, quite a struggle. I remember you articulated that, that very, very well, but also it was coming around to that point where you're really asking, here it is, for everybody else so they get a sense. I've been diagnosed with physical and mental illness, not deadly, not extremely serious, yet I am disturbed about the following thoughts. If the disease is part of a written script, what if it is also written that me, the projection of mind, will have a greater suffering predestined, like having cancer or having an accident where I'm burned alive, or what if I am a self-mutilator or I will hurt someone else? I understand that these are ego thoughts, not from the Christ, and that I really am, I really am, and these thoughts should not bother me, but I still feel fear. So, it goes on to say, I don't see myself in the place of Jesus being crucified without suffering. So, all that you're experiencing and all these hypothetical thoughts are being generated from the ego. What ifs, you know, it sounds like that's where the, the most torturing aspect in your mind is thinking, what if I die in a horrific death? Or what if I have a long and painful, slow death with cancer or something like this? You're scared of the effects and the ego has generated all these unreal effects and it says, oh look, it happened to other people. It could happen to you too. You know, maybe you'll be one of the unlucky ones or the ones that have to go and suffer. All pain is a misperception of, it's a, it's a misperception of the whole world. And all of these unreal hypothetical thoughts of pain and suffering and guilt are hell. So you don't have to worry about burning in hell when you die. You, it's already there. <laughs> you're dealing with it every day, you're dealing with hell. And I think everybody on this uh, online retreat can, can agree with you that that's, they're dealing with these kind of thoughts. The way out is perfect love cast out fear, is that as you open to your function, your miracle working function, and you let miracles start to come through your mind, they do a purifying and a cleansing and they purify your mind. The more you give yourself over to your function and you say, yes, I say yes to you, God. I will, I will be a servant of you. I will, I will do whatever I can to extend your love and light and, and extend forgiveness. Then that starts to rinse the mind of these hypothetical thoughts to the point that is the more it gets rinsed, the more you start to feel that the past wasn't really what it seemed to be, and the future is just another construct. And you start to come into the present moment, like Eckhart talks about, the power of now, you come deeper and deeper into that. You feel more content, you feel more whole, complete. You start to be unconcerned with these hypothetical thoughts. You are, become unconcerned with outcome. This is Mexico. For Christ's sake, the people are fantastic down here. They don't care about tomorrow. Manana, manana. You've got people all around you. Manana, manana. Who cares about manana? They don't really care. I mean, I had a friend I talked about on one of the online retreats, and he said, These people, they, they, sometimes they don't show up on time, and, and 
They come in late and I'm ready to really scream at them and then they got this big happy smile on their face. Hola! And they're just so happy. They're just living in the moment, you know? They're living in the moment. You, that's your gift. You've got all of Mexico and these wonderful expressions of the present moment surrounding you. All you have to do is open your eyes to it. All you have to do is think, oh yeah, these are reminders that things always work out, things are good, and, and you start to draw forth those witnesses. We're all sitting around in a beautiful house, a yellow house in Mexico here. It's an orange studio with yellow chairs and we're, we're just having fiesta down here. I also have siesta too. Siesta and fiesta. And it's, we're just living a joyful, happy life where we're drawing forth all these wonderful witnesses. You should come. I don't know where you are in Mexico, but you should come and visit us. Okay. We can dispel those, those hellish thoughts. <laughs> you are on fire. Holy smokes. <laughs> this is beautiful. Um, next on the list. What's that? <laughs> next on the list is Alicia. Go ahead, Alicia. Hi, everybody. Hawaii. Yeah. Day today, but... <laughs> The sun will shine. Um, I think my question touches Confucian levels, but um, um, one of the things that it have always maybe scared me a lot is when I have seen avatars or, or teachers, uh, Nisargadatta, Krinas Morty, Maharshi, Kenneth Wapnick, Rosa Maria Wynn, they have committed completely to this, and then all of them have cancer. Like that was part of their script. And I know one part of me says, if I choose the peace of God, if that is my purpose, whatever the form takes, it will not matter to me because I will be like you said with Eckhart Tolle, like in the moment. So the rest is, is seen from a different perspective. I can only see the fear when I'm out, if I'm in, everything becomes the illusion. But at the same time, there is a, a fear to do that step because it feels like that's a price. Like what she says, like seems that all these people that even committed, they still have that, it's that tragic thing on the script. And, and, and that's like, if there is not, if their mind is used completely for the purpose, if they have given their life to the Holy Spirit and everything is taken care of, is cancer part of the plan too? And, and that's what I, I know probably is a level confusion that it's like many of these Avatar Maharashi, I know that he couldn't care, could care less about the cancer. Like people, he, he was like, that's not even me. He, but it still was there. And um, I don't know, I, I sometimes, wonder seems like sometimes the lesson seems painful when I don't think there is a need for that. And, and, I, and I know that if you are, like, like you say in the moment, whatever is there is your value is not there. So if there is no value, it's neutral. It could be a healthy body, it can be a sick body. So if you're here, it's okay. But to give that a step to me, it feels like, what about if that? That's it. So, I, I, I hope I have explained. The yes, yeah, beautiful. Beautiful, Alicia. Yeah, we were just, the previous question, I was talking about these hypothetical thoughts. So, what I shared earlier was that, that the body is completely neutral. So, the body can't really have anything. I mean, what you have is what you are, is what the third lesson of the Holy Spirit is. So, so there's these images, we'll say images of time and space, and they come and they go. They come as little baby Rosemary Wynn, little baby Ramana Maharshi, little baby Ken Wapnik, little baby Nizargadatta, and they seem to go out at some age, whether it's 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever. And they appear and then they disappear. 
And that's the way with all the images in the world. They appear and they disappear. They just keep appearing and disappearing. And the thing about it is that because it's, it's a screen, you know, it would, it would be like, um, I remember one time somebody told me that, um, they told me they went to see uh, this movie and uh, at the end of the movie the, the main character died. It was Deborah Winger and um, um, Shirley MacLaine and at the end of the movie uh, Deborah Winger's character dies. It would be like going back to your family and saying Deborah Winger died. Uh, you know, and they the like, what? What do you mean Deborah Winger died? No, that's the movie. In the movie, the character that she played died, but she didn't, she didn't die. She's just an actress. That, she was playing a part. And it's the way with these characters that you were mentioning, even the avatars and the saints and whatever, they're just like characters that are playing a part, but, but they aren't really the part. You know, like when you, if you went to a theater, let's say you were an actress on Broadway and you kept playing this part for like four weeks while it was sh the show, the play was on Broadway and then you left, you know, you just left the part behind. You, you didn't, you continued on, but you, the part was the illusion. The human being, the person, is a construct. It's, it's an image. And it's just like in a movie, it's really no different than a movie or a dream. You know, it, it doesn't really have a life at all. It's just, it's like a, a made up thing that's part of the script. And it's, it's a character, but, but who the identity is, is not the character at all. And it's very hypothetical. So that's what I was saying at the beginning, that, that actually what I was saying last night is, the mind was sick that thought the body could be sick or the mind was sick that thought the body could have cancer. It's only a, a fragmented ego mind that believes that bodies could have cancer or heart disease, that believes there's reasons why people die. That's what the whole medical model is about. You have all these systems and oh, their heart stopped. Okay. Their brain activity stopped. Okay. They had cancer in an eye or a, a, a tumor or something like this. But but that is an image, it's still an interpretation. I mean, you saw last night, Calico was there on the couch radiating all this happiness and joy and talking about the giddiness and laughter and then she, she oh, by the, by the way, I have a, a tumor the size of a football and just continued almost like that was a side note. It wasn't even a footnote uh, in her joy that she was sharing. Because it's the interpretation in the mind is where the sickness is. It's the ego's interpretation. So, I can, when you think of Kenneth Wapnick or Rosemary Wynn translating the Course and Ramana and Nisargadatta and all these ones, they're like shooting stars of, of light and joy that the part that they play is, is just part of the fabric of the dream. It's not really who they are. And that's a key thing of what I'm teaching is that what Jesus says, he says, whenever you're not supremely happy, then you're dead. He says, and basically in Lessons 163 and 167, if you're not supremely happy, then, then you're dead. He doesn't even put sickness in there. You're either dead or you're alive. You're either alive as the Christ, alive in joy, alive in truth, alive in happiness, or you're, you're dead in ignorance, or you're dead in not knowing who you really are. You know, you're, the body is even in that sense, when you're following the ego, the body's more like a zombie, it's like the walking dead. You know, so what I'm really conveying to you is that the question will disappear when you just ask the Holy Spirit, say, show me that the body never has life, and never succumbs to death. That the body is never truly well or ever sick. Like those are just projections, like that movie Being There, you know, of putting meaning onto something. Uh, 
or like one of those um, overhead projectors that teachers use, you know, where they have this light and they start drawing and putting all these things on. Then it comes out on the wall as something. But once you take away all the overlays, those interpretations, then it's just pure white light that gets projected onto the wall. That's what the reality is, it's the light. And it's just these overlays of ego thoughts, just like Laura was talking about. What if I burn to death? What if I have cancer? You know, it's the same question you're asking. And what I'm saying is, all you have to do is be convinced that, that there's nothing real going on here. These are all just thoughts. And the ego thoughts don't have any reality. God didn't create cancer. I think that's one of the workbook lessons where he tells you to be specific. God did not create cancer, so it cannot exist. You know, that's like a specific application of, of, you know, God did not create this world. You might say the ego invented cancer, but God did not create cancer, so it cannot exist. It starts to loosen the mind from the fear about these hypotheticals. Hypothetical past, hypothetical future. That's what the trap is. Like we've talked, when you were here, you know, you say, I've, I've a husband, I have children, I live in Hawaii. Well, in the dream, if we, if we had the movie of Alicia, that's what the movie is. But, but that's not really who you are, but that's, that's how it looks in the dream. And yet when we have a dream, whether it's a happy dream at night or a nighttime dream, we wake up, we go, whew, that was interesting, but, but we don't, the emotions don't, they may still linger a bit, but once we start to realize that that's not who we actually are, we aren't, we aren't that character, we aren't that part, then it starts to get, all those fears of the future start to go away. They start to disappear. I have no idea. I don't know what my future is. I, I have no clue. I'm very happy, but I'm very clueless, too. Because I'm not really, I don't put any thought into the future. I don't want to be an avatar, I'm the Christ. <laughs> so I'm not concerned about what happens to avatar bodies. You know, like these video games, who really cares what happens to the, the avatar bodies? There's something more real, there's something real that's beyond the avatars. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. That's a great question, though. That's a, like a version of the last question. Yeah. Okay. A long list of hands, and I see Dennis is waving his hand. So let's see what uh, Dennis. What is your question? Go ahead. No, oh, I got to unmute myself here. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. You're good. Oh, okay. All right. Well, the question is. Basically, what I'm hearing from you, David, is the, that the practice of forgiveness on anything that comes up, whether it's a symptom or it's fear of death or heart problem like I have and it's going to end up with a pacemaker or whatever, that kind of stuff. When all that stuff comes up, it's not real, so I just forgive it and it, it gets released. And like I had Thursday before the first session on Friday, um, I had this revelation that this is not real. This is just part of the ego thought system. And for that, that time, I was totally free of it. And I could see that I didn't have to, in any moment, stay with the belief that of all these symptoms, because the symptoms are just ego, like ego thoughts. You know, just like being uh, upset with somebody because they said something. Well, I, uh, if I forgive that, then I recognize that which is just my projection, just my interpretation, but that's not me. That's just the ego doing its thing. And the same thing is happening with uh, um, <clears throat> all these symptoms that I have and my fears and anxiety about it and all that kind of stuff. It's, and also just yesterday, listening to everybody and realizing that I wasn't upset by what people were talking about. I wasn't emotional about it. And uh, I thought, well, I, maybe I should be emotional about it. But I wasn't. I was resting in peace and feeling 
radiant uh, listening to everybody talk about this stuff because I was at the witness of the dream, basically. And that's what I was seeing is the dream is going on and people are talking about something that's just part of the dream that's not real. It's just a projection of their ego and I'm witness to that. And that's about it. So I guess there's a question in that, but I just, I really want to just say that because it's, I want to have, have that be affirmed that it's true and also that it feels totally true to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's beautiful, Dennis, because you also articulated the, the, as the body is getting old, and I think you were saying in what your question that you wrote out, you know, it's like, oh my God, the body seems to be falling apart and, and pacemaker and different things that you've done to your heart. Well, to me, I see when Jesus says, you know, when you meet anyone, remember, it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you'll treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. I've got way with doctors, nurses, dentists, police officers. When I go to the airport and I'm going through security, you know, you see I fly. The body of David is flown all over the world in 40-some countries. I go through a lot of security uh, things. Sometimes they, do, they search you, you know, and everything. I come to enjoy all of it. Uh, I feel like I'm just to radiate the love. And I really feel that deep down that's what everybody is doing underneath it. They're, with their own belief system, they're trying to offer love based on what they believe is security, safety, you know. They're, I see it's a big love fest. So, like when I go to the dentist, it's six months to get my teeth clean, I'm going to really enjoy that that visit. You know, I'm going in there to really share love with the dental technician. Uh, sometimes you don't even see a dentist, you know, when you go to just you get your teeth clean, but I'm going to go there and really share the love. And it's the same if I go to market or if I'm on an airplane, if I'm going through metal detectors or whatever, you know, I'm, it's like a change of mind where I see it's this whole world has many opportunities to give and extend the love, just in, in, a, in an abundant way, you know, with, a, with an attitude mostly. And so that's like a change of mind where you start to see these encounters with the medical professions or with things, you know, even when different parts of the body. You know, if I eventually lose my voice for a toss, talking mystic, then I'll be really into the silence. I'll probably be sitting there with a big smile on my face, even if I can't talk. Now I have a voice, so I, I let the Spirit use that. And if I can't walk, or if I was limited in various ways, then I would, I would uh, relish the opportunity to beam in whatever context that is, because I feel like that's who I am and that's my purpose. And I do feel we all can do that. I, I, I don't feel there's any real limitations. Um, we always have a choice of our attitude. We always have a choice of our state of mind. And what you're doing when you just poured everything out in your questions and, you know, I think that was beautifully transparent. Here's what I'm dealing with. Uh, Many people feel like the human drama is like a drag, you know, the body <laughs> is a drag. And I suppose that to the extent that we still let the ego use the body, it's going to be a drag. But to the extent that we, we, we use each moment as best we can to say, okay, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? We start to tune into, wow, we've got a lot of love to give. And we can use the body to reach, to join, to communicate in that way. And then it, we start to get happier. Uh, and I've, seen some, I've met some people on this earth that they, their body can be breaking apart, they can be seemingly wrinkly and old as the world judges and all these things, and yet they've got the sparkly, twinkly eyes, and they've got this big smile on their face like they're the happiest person in the whole universe, but it does, they don't seem to take into account the body. I mean, the, through the eyes and the, the smile, it's radiating, they're radiating all this love. Like that Silva that Kirsten was talking about last night, uh, his body was re seemingly ravaged, as the world would judge it, and 
it was a miracle that he even got up on this mountain, the Blue Mountains where we were, and he just, by the time he got to talk, he was like a channel of the Holy Spirit. The, the body was meaningless to him. Uh, and all that history of all this war and all the things, drinking and all the, what he did to the body, that was all like gone. He was just a radiant, translucent expression of the Most High. And uh, that's, that's what I remember too about it. when Kirsten was telling the story, I had a tear going down my cheek because I was thinking, that's it. He just lit up. He, somehow they wheeled him up on this mountain and when he got there, he, he had a moment where he doubted and then he just, he totally lit up. That's the miracle. That's what the miracle is. Uh, well, anyways, I, like I said, I was retired at first. I didn't want to do anything and then that kind of became the mold. And uh, even though I teach a couple of classes, I just have no inspiration in, in if I, when I do have inspiration, it's just not about doing something. And I hear what you're saying is that, uh, I, and I do this a lot with people is when I go to the grocery store, I go to the dentist, I go to see people, I'm with them. And part of my purpose is to love to share the joy and to, um, just to communicate somehow with them, it doesn't make any difference about what, but just to share. And uh, I see that's the answer. It's just a matter of, uh, it seems like inspiration, but it's, part of it is just I don't have it, I can't decide what to do with myself other than teach these classes. But I do have this desire to do more. And uh, the classes that I teach, there's a group of people that are really committed and I want to do something with them. Uh, in a kind of a significant way. So we're all doing things together and also we're just helping people and serving people in some kind of way. And, uh, but I don't know what that will look like. I don't have the form. <laughs> yeah, it'll come. Yeah, it'll come. Well, that's beautiful. What well, we're on the final couple minutes. Uh, what's coming to me is we have a, we have a beautiful movie gathering. We're all going to share this afternoon and the kind of movies where we'll pray about what, which movie we show, but I'm thinking of some movies like The Guitar, where the main character basically is diagnosed to terminally ill, terminal illness, and then she gives herself so much allowance to, to do all the things that she's denied and repressed that she goes through a healing and a remission. Or like Source Code, where the main character's uh, body is almost irrelevant to the story because he starts to, to realize the power of the mind and the strength of the mind. And, and also we had uh, a Revolver mini-movie. Uh, some of you have seen Revolver with uh, Jake, Jake Green, the, the main character. He's given a terminal diagnosis and, and he, has to, he has to accept help because the Holy Spirit characters are saying, you know, we can help you. And his decision to open up to help opens up a total transcendence of the ego. He goes all the way with that help. He doesn't just take a little bit of help. He, he has to let go of pride and love of money and possessions and control and all these things in the, the span of seemingly with a, a terminal ill diagnosis. That's just the, the little tip of the iceberg. So I, I love it that you shared your symptoms because the symptoms sometimes are just the lead in to an extraordinary awakening experience because people feel like, wow, I have to really give my all to it. Like, this is important to me. So I think that's what's going to happen to you. There, there's some amazing things that are going to come your way, but it, you, don't, you can't know the form at this point. It's just, it, it will be given. <laughs>